Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soros. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming Dr. Lucas Huntimer, who is a Senior Advisor of External Innovation at Elanco in beautiful Greenfield, Indiana. Welcome, welcome to Pathfinder, Lucas. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I apologize for wearing the wrong collegiate attire today. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. I'm sure you will be forgiven, but it's great. It's great to know even, you know, your background and your path uh, to get to to here, to Indiana. So I'm I'm okay with you showing some of your colors <laughs> there and telling us a little bit, wearing them proudly, telling us a little bit about where you came from and what was your, you know, your background, your, your education. Um, I am so interested to hear your story. And we've, in, I've interviewed a few people from Milanco, but what was interested about, I was interested about your particular story is that you are a scientist. You started off in science but now you're doing more the business side of things, external innovation, looking at creating partnerships. I know you and I have uh, worked together to try to cement the collaboration between Elanco and Purdue. And so there is so much I want to know in particular about how you got into this area and how was the transition to go from a scientist and your hat as a scientist to maybe continue on, but now in this different perspective. So thank you so much uh, for, for coming on and letting us hear a little bit of your story. <laughs> Can you take us back as far as you want to take us and we'll go from there? Sure, sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start at the beginning. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a uh, a small uh, kind of farming and ranching community in, in eastern South Dakota called D. Smith, South Dakota. So if you're familiar with uh, the Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, series of, of, of books, Little House on the Prairie, D. Smith is one of those places that they lived in. So that's our kind of main claim to fame. But uh, where I grew up, there was uh, more densely populated cattle than, than people. <laughs> um and, and as such i grew up in a on a small kind of hobby cattle and, and horse ranch um uh, my mom's a, a nurse and my dad actually works in the the uh, meat um meat packing industry so um he's he's did various roles at uh, um some pork um uh, uh production facilities turkeys and now he actually is uh, works at uh, uh, Jack Link's Beef Jerky, and he's kind of one of the the more uh, senior executive folks in the quality space. So, I've always been connected to ag and then uh, food food supply. Um, um, growing up, um, and uh, always connected to to animals. Um, I uh, I uh, graduated high school and, and pursued a, a degree in biology and microbiology from uh, South Dakota State University. Uh, my dream was to, to actually try to go to dental school. Um, so I was on that, that uh, pre-med, pre-professional school track and, and um, ended up with a biology microbiology degree. Um, as I was uh, uh, applying to different dental schools um, around the country. I got put on a couple of wait lists uh, to, to get in and I needed something to do for the summer. Um, so I took an internship with a uh, small little vaccine company out in the middle of nowhere, uh, Northwest Iowa, uh, that was called Grand Labs. Um, and it was actually in the process of being uh, acquired by Novartis Animal Health. Um, but uh, uh, you know, the, the description was you get to play with some bacteria and, and you get to uh, uh, play with some some cattle and, and pigs, right, and, and that sort of thing. So I, I was interested. Um, I had very little knowledge, I guess, of kind of the animal health space and the vaccines 
space in animal health, um, despite, you know, growing up on a farm and actually using the products and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this internship really was a uh, um, uh, pivotal moment in that, you know, I, I, I got a chance to get a, a very, um, very oversight type of uh, view on industry at this uh, um, this uh, uh, site that had a really innovative kind of culture between R&D and manufacturing. So I, I, I entered as an entry level scientist that was on the bench growing bacteria, um, uh, scaling up bacteria for, for vaccine de development, um, participating in some some research around uh, evaluating, you know, vaccine efficacy and, and safety, um, and realized that there's a whole career space within this animal health industry, and that um, I really liked being on the bench and being in this position where you could see tangible outputs to you know, products and services being used by the the animal health production uh, around me, right? So the, the products we were making, I could see on the shelves in the vet clinic and see on the shelves of the tractor supply stores and that sort of thing. So that, that's been one major driver of, of everything I've, I've done and how I continued to, to stay in industry. Um, that was a, a, a really, uh, I, I kind of call that my master's career was that that three years I spent in that that internship role that rolled into kind of an entry level scientist role and then actually participated in some manufacturing and quality control uh, roles within within the animal health pharmaceutical industry. Um, but then I kind of reached a plateau of, of what you could do with uh, a bachelor's of science. And uh, I left uh, to pursue a PhD in immunobiology at uh, Iowa State University. And um, this, uh, this project um, in, in lab that I ended up um, um, being a part of was in uh, veterinary, microbi veterinary microbiology and preventative medicine uh, department, but it was a, a really cool project in that it was a collaboration with chemical and biological engineering, looking at different um, uh, different biomaterials as vaccine delivery vehicles and drug delivery vehicles. So uh, think controlled release applications for, for single dose. Um, and this was work funded by um, Department of Defense. So we were working on some some really uh, uh, nasty targets like anthrax and uh, plague and and high path avian influenza, which you know, is still around today and making some noise today. Um, so it it really uh, um, engaged me in the areas that that I I, I enjoy um, around infectious disease and then. Um, it was a really engaging PhD experience in that um, really diving deep into the, the kind of facets of immunology and honing different laboratory techniques um, in, a, in a collaborative program that kind of balanced biology and, and, and chemistry. Um, and it was a, a really worthwhile PhD experience, too, in that um, my principal investigator was pretty hands-off. He was kind of a, a, a sage old uh, um, uh, principal investigator. And he's also a department head, so his, his time was challenged sometimes, but uh, he was very good about um, uh, giving you enough rope to uh, kind of go off and explore and, and really having a true academic um, uh, experience and there's many, many a failed experiments and, <laughs> and failed attempts. Um, but uh, there was, it was definitely worthwhile because uh, uh, you know really it taught me how to kind of uh, uh, narrow focus as well as as collaborate across different groups and and uh, um, different aspects of the college as, as well as as be a bit of a um, your own boss, right, and, and running your program and, and uh, asking for help when you needed help. But uh, 
Um, as I was finishing up my academic career, though, um, I really I missed the pull of the tangibility of of working on on things and products that could could get out there. Um, really, again, worthwhile PhD experience. We had uh, uh, tons of publications and and that sort of thing, and that was that was great. But I really wanted to get back into industry. Um, uh, and thankfully, I, I was able to um, maintain those connections from my my early days at uh, Novartis Animal Health. And uh, there was a, a, a project leadership position that that was available as I was finishing up my PhD. So, so I actually ended up taking a a role um, back with Novartis. And uh, while I was finishing up my PhD dissertation. Um, which I do not recommend <laughs> trying to work a full-time job and finish up your PhD dissertation either. There was a, uh, a lot of weekends that I would drive back to, to Iowa State and do some lab experiments and tons of writing at night and and defending. Um, but uh, thankfully, everything worked out and uh, I was able to um to navigate that but um yeah that was a uh, uh, a really uh, uh kind of a um heavy time of of <laughs> buckling down and getting things done but uh uh worthwhile uh to to finish out and um that thankfully I had a really supportive principal investigator and collaborator there and and Novartis was really supportive about that as well um but yeah, so then um, I was at Novartis Animal Health and I was a what they called an RPL or research project leader. So basically I was the focal point for leading global development of different swine and cattle vaccine projects. Um, so basically you kind of uh, act as the the center in a, a wheel of, of different cross-functional groups um, that you need to leverage to, to register a product, whether those groups can be uh, technical development scientists, analytical scientists, manufacturing, uh, regulatory authorities, so interactions with uh, um, the uh, USDA or FDA, uh, as well as uh, legal and quality control, but essentially you kind of act as the owner of those those individual programs. Um, so I was uh, able to to perform that role for a couple of years, and then uh, uh, Novartis Animal Health was acquired by Elanco Animal Health, um, and uh, uh, Elanco uh, acquired the uh, the Larchwood site. Um, and I moved into kind of a broader um, role beyond just vaccines and biologics. It was a, a multifunctional uh, project leader role exploring uh, alternative to antibiotics. Um, so the idea was um, trying to um, find as much um, external and internal um, ideas that could be antimicrobial alternatives um, to try to provide solutions to, um, you know, some of the uh, antimicrobial usage in the, the animal health space. So, um, you know, very heavy vaccine component, but this also included things like uh, uh, nutri nutraceuticals or nutritional health supplements, uh, immunomodulators, um, uh, different uh, different small molecule approaches that were kind of non antibiotic, um, but uh, it was a really good experience in that I got to broaden um, not only my uh, expertise beyond kind of vaccines and biologics into uh, small molecules and the nutritional health space, but um, I also got to broaden uh, experience into different species that are important to, to animal health. So I started doing and taking on a bunch of both poultry projects, um, some aquaculture projects, and then eventually ended up uh, taking on some projects in the uh, companion animal or pet health space as well. So dogs and cats for us. So um, uh, that role um, uh, really was one of the first forays into this kind of external innovation um, term. 
that we had where we're looking at uh, uh, different technologies, uh, different intellectual property, um, uh, different approaches from that environment outside of, of Elanco Animal Health and um, seeing how we could uh, essentially collaborate and develop those those business relationships where you know we could potentially work and develop a, a technology together right um, I was very much the the recipient of external technologies and taking them and testing them in the the different uh, uh, models to to prove out their their efficacy and safety and, and reproducibility, but as such, I was having some interactions with the the external uh, innovation groups as well as these external companies or or academics or whoever it may be on on evaluating those technologies. So, and that's really what spurred my interest in in being in this this role I'm in now, um, where it's a it's a kind of a balance between the science and the business side. So I, I like to characterize it about 75% science and 25% business. Um, but it's it's really the interface of trying to learn what's out there in that external space. Yeah. And it's... do new new discoveries and and different uh, uh methodologies, um new pathways, um, et cetera, that can you know, be leveraged for areas of importance as in, in animal health and in particular in, into Elanco. So um, we interact with a lot of human health uh, startup biotechs as well as large human health companies. But we also interact with uh, academic institutions that drive the discovery research as well as other animal health companies uh, because we will... Uh, often trade or collaborate or, you know, look to leverage each other's expertise. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a good, uh, fun role that in, in engages me still on that science end, but it also brings a little bit of this uh, business and, and strategic uh, business focus piece uh, um, that I wasn't sure I knew I liked, but now that I'm in it, <laughs> I realize I do. And do you ever see it transitioning to be more on the business than on the science in your mind? Um, there's certainly opportunities for that. Um, and uh, I could see it being that way uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, there's always a pull for me to be closely connected to the science. So I, I like being connected to the R&D and the, the technical end of it um but yeah it's a, it's a good question and it's a, it's one of those things that i could actually see myself doing a bit more of a a business focused um role more than what i already do now i mean some days are 100 percent business <laughs> and, and less science uh, but uh yeah i could i could definitely see a scenario where where it's uh you know looking at one of those uh, more uh, business, you know, oriented uh, roles for, for short, short term. But I think uh, ultimately, you know, I, I'm always going to want to have at least some sort of pull back into the, the science and the technical aspect. But the beauty of uh, being a, uh, you know, a, a animal health pharmaceutical company is that you're always connected to the, the science and that you're, you know, you're trying to prove put out a, a science-based solution to, you know, a veterinarian or a pet owner or a producer to, to solve um, some sort of uh, problem. Yeah. And so, Lucas, I, I love the, the whole journey and the way that you painted it. Take us back, though. Take us back to the time that you realize, well, dental school is really not what I'm going to be doing. Were you disappointed? Yeah, it was a little bit, right, that it was it was waitlisted, right, and then um, there was that there was that disappointment for sure of not quite, you know, reaching reaching the goal in the bar yeah. um, that I wanted, and it was it was not an overnight. Like I would say, realization of I could pivot into this um, this career. Now that being said, though, it was 
fairly quick um, into this this internship. I mean, it was you know a whole summer internship that was wrapping up towards the end, um, and I, I had some really encouraging feedback from the people I was working with too. Of hey, you know you're you're doing well right in this in this space. Um, yeah. You're you're an agile learner you know, you, you've got the skills, right, um, and and the drive to, to want to learn this more, uh, and, you know, that was, that was a real pivotal kind of piece, too, of um, getting some feedback from, I would say, more senior folks that, you know, have made a career out of that, and, and having some of those kind of just frank, open discussions on, um, you know, what sorts of paths are outlined in, in animal health, uh, industry rates or, and, uh, and being able to take that feedback in and, and realize that, uh, you know, actually I was having fun at what yeah. I was doing. It was, it was satisfying me. And, um, there's, there's a, a whole wealth of, you know, career opportunities within this space that it, I didn't even know about. And that's, that's, yeah one of my passion points of doing things like this too, is just talking about what sorts of uh, careers that are out there. Cause I mean, I was, I was around it, you know, like I said, we were using these products, um, but I just, I had no clue of, of what could be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the dentistry path was just something that you, had thought of oh how how cool would it be to become a dentist but and maybe but so so but that image of having a dental office or right a dental <laughs> practice that image is totally different than the farm image yep um and so but so maybe growing up in the farm, you think that that was like, ah, hey, well, this is what we do. Let me go find a profession now, right? Yep, yep. Um, so, so interesting. Yeah, and I think some of it, you know, it's growing up in a small, small town community, like the the prestigious places in town are like the doctor's office, right, and the dental office. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, you know, that kind of colors your your aspirations as a as you know as a as a young person that's interested in in science and that's basically all you kind of really see yeah. right what i didn't realize was just all of the other types of roles that are out there in science yeah. right <laughs> and absolutely yeah. Yeah. and it sounds like when you described it too it sounds like your father had a bit of an influence. I don't know if it's a mentorship type of influence, but he he had an impact or an influence on your trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's kind of connectivity to um, a bit of that, uh, the ag, ag business space, right. And, and seeing a little bit, of the holistic view of look we're raising the cattle out here like or, you know we had a, a small um uh cow calf operation at our at our place right we'd uh raise some calves sell them at the sale barn um and then you see you know those calves go to the the, the feedlots in and around our community and you know we we're we're good friends uh local friends with one of the largest kind of uh, feed finish uh, outfits in the in the U.S. and in the in that community, right? And so you see that, but then you see the you know the the full value chain of you know the, those cattle making it to market and and ending up into you know your your protein sources and, and kind of the the full end to end view of that, and it also gives you appreciation for all of the the different aspects and, yes. and resources that go into putting you know protein on a plate right and um you almost de develop this thing of um you know not wanting to to kind of waste food because of that right because you see all of the efforts and all yes. of the 
you know, resources of time and people that goes into, you know, taking those those things into that. So it get, really gives you an appreciation of the whole kind of value chain. That that I think that is so important because I am I'm, I'm always a proponent of of that because I don't think people do realize the amount of effort that it takes to display the food in such a beautiful way in our supermarket and what what level of quality assurance that really takes all the way from the farm until that 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 uh, piece of produce or food gets mm-hmm. gets to the market it's an incredible process the animal side the plant side the shipping distribution the storage uh, housing you know like oh my gosh there's so much so many facets that make it so interesting um and so i agree with you i think having that understanding and firsthand understanding of what it is i mean i can see why uh you do so well and have so much success in your career because you really know that process hands on and and you you I guess, uh, had uh, exposure to the process uh, from a very, very early age. Uh, and and so you must have been quite uh, in this internship that you talk about. Like, were you a technician? You were the all around uh, hunter that did, <laughs> did whatever was required. Tell us a little bit about that time because it sounds, first of all, super exciting for you as a realization, the way you described it, that like, oh my gosh, I could make something of this. But then also the experience of this uh, this thing being bought out by Novartis and mm-hmm. you you having close eye look at what that was all about in that transition. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the, I guess, the great aspects about that, that time is the kind of internship morphed into entry level technician scientist yes. on, on the bench was um, and it, this was still kind of viewed as that small entity. Um, Novartis uh, essentially owned them very, very soon after I had, had officially joined. Um, but it was still kind of ring fenced as this, you know, small little operation. And that meant that you got to do a little bit of everything, <laughs> which was a really a really valuable experience yeah. for me uh, and a really uh, and that's basically brought through to my entire career. So I was not only, you know, microbiologist on the bench growing bacteria. I was paperwork rates uh, uh, in, in manufacturing, um, working with manufacturing and technology transfer from lab scale to pilot scale um, manufacturing environment. So I got to to do that on top of, you know, kind of uh, the role of, of bench scientist, I got to be a clinician, right, and go out into the field and, you know, interact with the animals, take clinical scores, be part of the clinical trials, draw blood, right, and <laughs> do all of that. Yes. Um, I also got to wear a regulatory hat. I was involved with writing the reports that would go into the USDA um, documentation. Um, So you got to participate in kind of all the different parts that it takes um, to to develop a a vaccine and and, uh, uh, bring it to market, right? Um, And that was truly valuable. And a lot of those those same principles applied not only beyond vaccines, but into small molecules and, and nutritional health as sure. well. But it's it's really around um, you know all the different parts. As Novartis kind of you know uh, integrated more, and as I've navigated my career, the pharmaceutical industries more um, that that kind of breadth of experience is a bit more specialized 
right? So you you end up being parts of groups and teams that'll that'll focus a little bit more on on a singular aspect of bringing a technology to the market. So you may have a group that's that's solely focused on that uh, um, analytical development or developing assays that help analyze the amount of drug or, or vaccine in a product, or you might have a group that's solely focused on on regulatory affairs. So they're 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 the ones interfacing with the government and uh, on behalf of the company. Or you have um, scientists that decided they wanted to have a law degree and then went into the intellectual property attorney and or business attorney space, right? So um, I have a lot of good friends in the the legal side that are, you know, scientists and and lawyers on top of it, <laughs> right? Which totally. is really valuable because yeah. then you can you can talk specifics on the science with them and they they understand it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, as as you know, these companies get uh, bigger, everything gets a little bit more kind of specialized. But um, it was really valuable that early part of my career having that that breadth kind of piece and that's that's one of those valuable pieces about working in 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 an academic environment because you get the same sort of uh uh essentials around that of you're kind of the 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 group that has to do a little bit of everything of everything going that's right um but you know biotechs too like startup biotech yeah that sort of thing um one of my my uh, kind of career advice uh, aspects for for young scientists too is look if you can join a startup biotech um, that is a great time to do it because you're going to be put in those positions as well where you're going to get uh, to dabble in in all the different parts of, of right. this yeah I you know I think it's so important uh, and it, it, it even if you it, even if you're not confident that you have everything that it takes to become the Swiss army knife for the company. Like you have to know that it's going to be okay. And that you're going to go through that learning process at the beginning is so uncomfortable, but you get, you get more and more comfortable and the people that you do it with, I, I always found that to be exciting, right? Like there's a pace, there's a certain, uh, risk, uh, die hard <laughs> attitude that like, we got to do this and it's all hands and, you know, and I, and people that come on the program, they say that over and over again is that you really have to become, uh, a little bit of everything for mm-hmm. that, for that company. And it's almost like you don't really have a choice. Uh, you can't say, well, I'm not being paid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't go so well. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so, but, but Lucas, you never had to interview or did you to get hired by Novartis? I mean, you were in this little startup thing as an intern yeah. And then and then you I mean, did you really even have to interview to get that position? So uh, yeah, when when I came back after my PhD, I did go through a formal interview and I was um there was definitely a competition um for <laughs> for that. Um I I will say, you know, I and I completely acknowledge this too. I mean, it was having that internship that turned into kind of entry level piece right was gave me a leg up because I was a known quantity right to to them yes. um and um you know I there was four or five other you know scientists that I was competing with um for for the role at that time and um yeah it, it them knowing me and and knowing my ways of working and personality absolutely was was oh. beneficial um but uh, yeah, I mean, that being said, that's why it, it is a really uh, good opportunity to gain some of those internship experiences and, and you know, uh, networking experiences. Um, and it, it is a challenge, too, because you, you talk to students on, you know, 
one of the major questions we get is how do you break into to industry, right? And yeah. it's uh, I, I I totally empathize with it because they'll you know see roles and all of them require x amount of years of experience, right? Um, right. To to even be looked at. So finding those creative avenues to gain some entry level, you know, kind of experience in the industry experience. So you can leverage that for that future role are, are pretty critical. So internships or, or even collaborations between academia and university where, you know, for we're collaborating on a sponsored research agreement with Purdue University, um, those grad students or, or, or um, undergrad students that are working in the lab They'll get to have some interaction points with the industry and kind of yeah. learn uh, a bit on those. So trying to find those areas if if someone's interested in an industry type of career where they could, um, you know, get in and, and learn and interact and network a little bit are crucial. Yeah, there are also sometimes opportunities where the industry sponsored project is what you can adopt as your grad school yeah. project right and yep. that as you said that gives you that lets you get your feet wet and get uh, to be known by the industry sponsor industry partner um, uh, awesome awesome advice because I think you know there's there's a lot that people go through when they think about, well, what am I going to become? And if you at least you already know that, OK, well, I have to get a Ph.D. because that's the level I want to achieve. But I want to do a Ph.D. that also involves industry because I know that eventually that's where I want to go and to have that maturity or foresight to know that that is also an option. Yep. Um you know, we talk a lot about mentors here, um, how you should pick a good mentor and maybe you should go into a good lab that has you have chemistry with the people in there. But then there are also people that are more driven, career driven and know what they want. And, you know, the, like people are mainly an obstacle, not necessarily enablers <laughs> for, for some of these people, right? Let, let me just do what I need to do. Let me get in there. What about you, though? It seems like you had a wonderful PhD, the way that you describe this thing. I'm like, man, I want, I want to do a <laughs> PhD like that. Yeah. What was that like? And did you have good mentors during that period? Yeah, yeah. So uh, great mentors during that period. Um, there was, it was a difficult time when I went back to school to, uh, this was around the 2007, uh, 2008. So if uh, everyone recalls this is housing crash, the economy was very uh, dour, <laughs> I would say. And um you know, I was I was accepted at uh, Iowa State, but the there wasn't a lot of labs with a lot of funding, right? Um, and uh, so there, the options were limited. And um, you know, it, there was a really good experience to you know essentially uh, uh, do different. Uh, um, I think they call it shadowing, but essentially you embed them in, in a lab for two to three months, right? And yeah. and and try to understand uh, the projects as well as the people and, and see if there's opportunity. And I did four of those and two of them wouldn't have been able to take me if I wanted to anyway, because there wasn't enough funding to support a grad student. Right. Um, Thankfully, my interest in, in background, having, you know, three years at, uh, at, at Novartis um, as a vaccine development married up quite nicely with um, this, this grad student program that was being, you know, funded through um, Department of Defense grants where they were looking at vaccines, right, and, and yeah. um, doing that. And uh, it was a, it was a really good um, program that fit my interest. But it was also a people fit, right? I could tell um, the the mentors and 
the the leadership within that group um were were good good people and solid mentors and the type of um kind of mentorship that I was was seeking I think having a little bit of um internal insight on kind of the best ways that you work can be helpful for that too. Um, Cause you know, there was rotations where I had uh, a, a mentor that was uh, I would say much more hands-on and I was not as engaged <laughs> with that rotation. And, you know, you, you know it at the time, but you know, you know, especially now looking back and realizing kind of the, the ways of working and what makes me tick as an individual is micromanagement. This is not something that uh, uh, I respond well to. Like I have, I want to have a little bit of, of freedom and agility to move. Yes. And, um, you know, and I couldn't really formalize it maybe necessarily into words at that point, but in looking back on that now, it's, Oh yeah, this is why I was drawn to this group because yeah. the, the science was good, the the people were good, but it was a good balance of yeah. um, macro management, <laughs> I would say, yeah. right? Um, and uh, the ability to to kind of learn and and learn by doing, um, yeah. But by doing yourself, right? Because yeah. it sounds it sounds to me like, you know, the principal investigator although you describe him as a sage, he had his time cut out and he couldn't spend too much time, uh, quote unquote, babysitting too much. <laughs> uh, but, but as you describe it, you like, it gave you the impetus to seek out collaborations and your own independent, rational way of approaching and, yeah, did you? I mean, you must have discussed this with with the people. But as as I think, you know, many people forget is they think that that the principal investigator is their boss rather than their advisor. Mm. Uh, they're really there to advise you in what your you know what you think you want your thesis to be all about and tell you, oh, this might look better than this or that. Yep. But that independence, my gosh, that must have given you uh, wings, uh, confidence. It must have given you also this ability to start working with others and start seeking yep. out advice from others. But did anybody ever give you any advice on like, well, as you transition to industry or did they know that you kind of had your mind set or your target on going back and and working with Novartis? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I didn't necessarily have it um, in my mind right away when I entered grad school that I was going back into to industry. I was open to um, all aspects. Um, and I guess as, as the years progressed, um, you know, into my, my academic experience, I got, a, I got a chance to be involved with some of the, you know, kind of heavy grant writing sessions and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, um, those are fun. I mean, very worthwhile experiences, but, um, there was also the realization that you're running this, this little research business, I guess, within the, the overall, uh, uh, overall halls of the university yeah. um, and you know you're really responsible for keeping the lights on and getting that next stage of research going yeah. um, and there's some certain there's aspects of that that are really empowering and that you're kind of owning this this piece um, but again I hearken back to a little bit of the that tangibility of, of doing all of that effort but hope, hopefully resulting in something that's kind of going out the door um, yes. to the, to a consumer is what, what drove me. So that's, that's really what uh, kind of made me shift um, focus back into wanting, wanting to go back in the industry. I was open to different, maybe governmental research roles and, and actually did a fair amount of work with USDA um, yeah. while I was there in Ames because they were, you know, right down the road from us. So we did some collaborations and, 
there was a point where I was kind of exploring one of those uh, agricultural research services type of scientists and, and project leader type of roles too. And, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, ultimately industry, you know, uh, kind of grabbed me because I can just understand it. Um, right. And, and, and really the, the focus on, on uh, uh, development of a, of a product. And yeah. I think it ultimately harkens back to that, that initial experience I had um, early on of really seeing end to end what it takes to, to make a product and, and get it out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to the, the academic experience too, is um, you really, you end up building an informal kind of uh, mentorship team around you um, when you're in that environment too. So there was some critical uh, assistant professors and just, you know, more senior members of the lab as it was joining that were really, really big influences on me looking back now on how to, how to, you know, essentially uh, develop a research thesis, right, and 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 work towards that, and that was really really useful as well. Yeah, and you know when you when you were talking a little bit about that uh, that first impression, you know, to me it was clear that being able to touch and use the product. At the end, I mean, when you described that, you said, you know, like I would see that in the vet's clinic and I would, I, we were using it with our animals or whatever it was. It's like, there must be so much satisfaction in being able to not only use that final product, but knowing the effort. Uh, money, people, mm -hmm. energy, animals. Uh, <laughs> my gosh, that it took to develop such product. And, you know, there, it, there must have been also inside of you some inkling of, I'm, I'm making a difference here, what I'm doing, which it's uh, almost untangible in academia, unless you're doing something that is applied or something that is requested as a contract yep. or so on. If you're studying a particular basic principle or basic function, you know, I, it, it, you don't always get those, aha, uh -huh, I'm making a difference yep. <laughs> moment. <laughs> uh, you know, I got a band on my gel and the PCR worked, <laughs> you know, or whatever it might be. Uh -huh. But but so like so now you you again like you didn't really have to interview for Elanco, but your purchase Novartis yep. is purchased by Elanco Animal Health. And again, now you get into this role where the number of products is much larger, right? The company is larger now. You're you're now interacting with these different groups. Tell us a little bit about that transition. Was that was that unnerving because you thought, oh gosh, how how are things going to work out? Did you think you're going to lose your job, or did you? How? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that, that crosses yeah. everybody's mind, right? They're going to yeah. they're going to buy the company and then they're going to fire us all. Yeah, they don't need us, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I've been uh, privileged, I guess to <laughs> undergo uh, navigation of lots of uh, more business type of aspects that, that have happened. So I've been through kind of multiple acquisitions now, and I've actually been part of a site closure, um, the, the Larchwood, Iowa site that I, you know, started my career at and spent, yeah. uh, you know, first close to I guess almost 10 years of my career there. Um, we essentially had to absorb those operations into another site that we had purchased. So, you know, those, um, the, the, the aspects of R and D and, and, uh, um, manufacturing were redundant, right? So we had to, to consolidate. So I was actually part of a group that 
you know, did the work of archiving materials and transferring those materials. And there's a, a lot of uncertainty um, in that time. And um, it, uh, um, that's actually what led me out to, to Indiana at that point was taking on a new role that developed in, you know, these, these different uh, mergers and acquisitions that happened. So I ended up needing to, you know, apply for this role um, and go through that process again. Um, and, you know, thankfully, you know, ended up uh, uh, obtaining that role. But, uh, you know, it was, hey, you need to move out to, to Indiana <laughs> if you're going to take this role. So, um, you know, I had a wife and a, a young child, a wife who was pregnant, actually, at the time, and a young child. So there was lots of uncertainty of, well, we got to pick up and, and move to a place that we knew very little about. I visited a few times because Elanco's headquarters was out here, but uh, I didn't know much about the area or community. And then, um, yeah, managed to to make a nice little, uh, you know, uh, 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 home out here and in, in, in a nice community we ended up in. And uh, but yeah, we had certain uncertainties continuing with uh, Elanco was part of uh, Eli Lilly um, uh, during this this time as well. And then uh, Eli Lilly had a new um, uh, chief operating uh, or CEO um, when John Linklater retired and Dave Ricks came in and he had a different philosophy on, on having an animal health division, right? So mm -hmm. um, they, they were taking, taking looks at all parts of their business and they decided that, um, you know, we should uh, essentially be a separate company and not part of Eli Lilly. So there's definitely some nerve wracking times <laughs> that, that went into, into that too. And, uh, we essentially, we spun out and uh, we're an independently publicly traded company now on the New York Stock Exchange, but there's a lot of nerve wracking days involved with, with those too. Yeah. Um, and then just recently, you know, we've, we've purchased another major kind of animal health company and integrating those folks uh, yes. into, into Elanco and having been through all my past experiences now, it's, Gives me a perspective that I can, I can look at the the folks coming in and, right. and know their uncertainty because I've felt that a couple of times in the past now. Sure. So I can I can empathize with their uncertainty and yeah. and what the future may look like. But I think ultimately the message with with a lot of those things is, um, you know, control what you can control and be excellent at what you can control right in the value to the company or the academic institution or wherever it may be will will um be shown right, right. um and um you know it's okay to advocate for yourself too so you know um don't uh don't necessarily always rely on you know the work being the thing that uh um that is going to be the the leading indicator of those things. You know, sure. it, sometimes you need to step up and get involved with things that you're uncomfortable knowing or or doing, but there there they can be opportunities for for development as well as opportunities for you know building your internal network or external network. Yeah. Um, and it, it can really demonstrate your your skill sets to to different people. Yeah. And Lucas, in in your current role, are you thinking, well, maybe I should have or maybe you still can because the company would support you in going after an, a, a traditional MBA or like an executive MBA program? Is that is that something that you think would be beneficial? Is that something that people in academia who are thinking, well, I want to become a Lucas one day. A doc <laughs> Dr. Huntimer has inspired me here. And, you know, like, is that something you wish you would have done and been more prepared? Or are you thinking about that now? How how does that work within the company dynamics? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great question. 
Um, in my earlier time, I think it would have been a really valuable pursuit, say during my grad school career, or even early um, in my industry career. Um, at this stage, having done this role for as long as I have now, I've had some of these critical discussions. Is absolutely um, on board with with doing some uh, and supporting work towards uh, further education and for to answer that question. But I've uh, I've had a bit of an MBA by fire, I guess, <laughs> in in my role being in it for for close to five years now, and um, there's. You know, there's still certainly areas that um, I'm, I'm learning and growing on the kind of more business um, uh, side of what I do. Um, but I've, I've also been able to to learn by doing and, and being part of all, a lot of these. And um, after kind of reviewing some of the curriculum and being part of some of uh, some more biotech focused business training programs and that sort of thing. So not necessarily a, a formal MBA, but I've been through a couple of different um, uh, training programs put on by Bio International and some other groups. And um, it, the, my my skill set is probably almost <laughs> to an MBA. I may not have the formal letters uh, at this stage, but um, uh, I do think I would have had less kind of uh, uh, trial by fire in my <laughs> role if I would have had an MBA earlier. <laughs> yes. And I had always danced around, danced around it, but never um, took the plunge earlier in my career. And I think it it may have been a been beneficial if you're interested in a role like I'm doing yeah. now. So not only the PhD, but also if you can dedicate the time to do uh to do some of that um i i you know i think it's it's also um good to know that uh um and i see you typing on your computer should i should i pause no oh, you're sorry good. just wrote, okay. sending a quick message uh, uh, okay. to a person there that i'm no. uh, meeting next <laughs> no problem. I'm sorry to hold you up here, um, but I'm so thankful that that you really are opening up to some of these things because I think these are questions that a lot of a lot of the people that do watch have concerns about in terms of like should I be preparing myself? And I love that you mentioned Bio International. Is that a good resource for people that are interested to get some more information about these types of uh, biotech uh, business, biotech, um, you know, more more on the yep. business side of things? That that's great. I also wanted to you know, maybe get you to reflect on that because you've been through my acquisitions, purchases, and like all through the rigmarole of being shed from a company. <laughs> I mean, there are very few other scenarios that, you know, there are a few scenarios, but like you've been through these very different scenarios and you've you've experienced them firsthand I would think as a as an employee of the company but also did you get to do a little bit of the of like you know negotiating or did you get to see a little bit of how the negotiating was taking place and did they ask for your help? I mean, what <laughs> uh, what is that role from the business side of things, if you can share a little bit with us? Yeah, yeah. So um, short answer is yes. Um, so um, really my role, uh, as it's outlined, is trying to find those innovative opportunities and bring them back to the company. And we end up developing you know, small teams around that evaluate not only the science and the technical aspects of whatever's out there, but the business case, right? What would be, um, you know, a peak sales of this this product in all these different geographies? What is the probability of success based on the science and, and technical aspect of us 
achieving that, right? Um, what are the manufacturing considerations, right? Could we, are we going to manufacture this internally? Do we need to rely on partner for manufacturing? Do we need to look at third party manufacturing, right? Um, the regulatory pieces, again, right? We, we interface um, most of what we see is not fully gone through the development process and is, is registered through the FDA or, or USDA. So, you know, you start getting inserted into those conversations and, and those sorts of things too. But um, um, one of the, one of the kind of key aspects that's, that's really a interesting process is the due diligence process after, you know, you have your first uh, initial kind of, um, back and forth with uh, a company or, or technology, um, and then you end up formalizing what that um, next step is going to look like, right? Are we going to in-license this technology where, you know, Elanco takes it and we develop a product app um, around it? And then once that product's out of the marketplace, it's selling, you know, can, portions of that sales go back to the, the inventors, their owners, or are we going to acquire that, that product? Um, and in that case, you know, what's the value, you know, of that, that particular technology or, or product versus, you know, our valuation of that, that and where we kind of meet in the middle. And that's where a lot of those negotiation points happen right yeah. so you're you're having to build a value case yes. and you're going to have to you know then take that value case and work with the external partner which is going to have a different value case right sure. and if we're going to you know move forward with something there's a, a lot of back and forth and yeah. and uh, um that's that's where a lot of my <laughs> role is now is in in helping and in, in building some of those those value cases and technical cases as well as doing some of that negotiation with the partner and so have you had like did they get you to do some negotiating courses and training and stuff like that yeah yep so bio international has some um uh really good training modules around business development in the biotech space okay. i would highly encourage they are very useful one of their entry or intro to um business development uh, courses really takes on some of that uh, negotiation principles and then there's a more advanced once you've done that course there's a more advanced uh business development in, in biotech course or which really teaches you the kind of valuation models around that and then integrating that into negotiation awesome awesome i am uh so thrilled i could keep asking you questions <laughs> and keep uh learning from you because i've i've learned so much uh from from what you said and i'm gonna go check out the bio international courses because i think i could benefit from some of those <laughs> too um it's been a pleasure uh, Lucas, any question that I didn't ask you that you would want me to ask you? Um, I guess the only only question or comment, I guess, is, is you know, feel free to 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 reach out to people within these industry spaces for, um, you know, insights into to careers and, and aspects of that. Um, uh, I, like I said, one of the passion points of mine is just trying to, you know, uh, interface with with uh, young scientists and, and students that may be interested in the industry and just kind of talking through the different aspects of, of what's feasible out there. And and uh, uh, most <laughs> most folks in these spaces are, are open to, to having those conversations. So, you know, you know feel free to, to reach out to people that you may know or interact with and try to you know, gain some time into um, what it what it's like in industry, if it's a fit for you. And, um, you know, um, that helps build the the network a bit too, um, if you're really interested in, in breaking into industry. 
Well, I'm so glad I reached out to you and I'm so glad that we got to uh, talk uh, because again, I think you provided so much great information. Dr. Lucas Huntimer, Senior Advisor, External Innovation at Elanco Animal Health in beautiful Greenfield, Indiana. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being our Pathfinder today. And I hope you have a great afternoot. Thanks, Tommy. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks,